All right. Um, before I start my PowerPoint, I brought in some picture books. I know we talked a little bit in class about picture books for social studies and those type of subject areas, but has anybody ever seen a picture book for math? Well, you guys are really talented. <laughs> I guess in middle childhood, we're focused more on um, order of operations and functions. I mean, you'll see graphs, but nothing really fun. So, never mind. I was just trying to use that as an example. Um, a book that I have actually used in a classroom before, I did this during my student teaching for sixth graders. I think it might be a little difficult for kids below that unless they're very familiar with some of the vocabulary within it, and circumference and the first round table, and there's like a play on, on words there. Um, it's about nice little round table. Well, circumference had an oval table, and they kept banging elbows, so they made it round, and they use a lot of vocabulary and fun storytelling and a lot of play on words there. And I'll pass these around, and there's a whole series of the circumference guide. Mm -hmm. Great Night of Angle Land. Um, so I'll pass those around. I have a bunch of those at home, but I didn't bring them. So. And this early childhood, I don't know. I just grabbed something from the library just to have to show you guys. Uh, a point is the first star in the sky when night comes. It's making it real life. And then, this, this is one of the articles I found. I really liked it. Um, Chasing Vermeer. I've never read the book, but I'm going to now that I have read the article about it. And it's like finding a painting. And they use pentominoes, which is just five squares. You guys are probably familiar with those. And they use these to decode and find words. And they break them up. So I'll pass this around with the article. I, I'm really interested. In this. I'll start over here. Okay, so now I will go on. There's my story telling there. All right, I really like this. Is this the clicker that you? Oh. I really like this. Every time I see a math word problem, it looks like this. If I have 10 ice cubes and you have 11 apples, how many pancakes will fit on the roof? Answer purple because aliens dump our hats. How many of you feel like that in math? <laughs> yeah. And I think a lot of it has to do with you don't, you're not fluent in mathematical language. So, that's a lot to do with it. Um, and then NCPM, it's the SPA for math. It's the <coughs> National Council of Teachers of Mathematics. And they have four goals ultimate goals, organize and consolidate mathematical thinking, communicate coherently, analyze and evaluate other strategies, and use language to express mathematics precisely. So you have to use language to express it. You can't just write 1 plus 1 equals 2. You can sometimes, but if you don't understand the concept behind it, it it's hard. Um, one part of communication is applying mathematical language and using it fluently. I like how we've done the fluency and we'll do comprehension later, but I talked a little bit about it. Um, with standardized tests becoming, well, what am I looking for? Well, everybody is gearing themselves toward their teaching. Well, they require deeper thinking and understanding. And how do you assess and teach deeper thinking? My first picture there, 1 plus 1 equals 2. Well, you can create a pretty simple word problem with that. One apple, Gary had one apple, Matt had another apple. How many apples do they both have? Well, they have two apples. But how do you get into order of operations? By looking at the original problem, 6 minus 5 minus 3 plus 10. Could you guys create a word problem based off that? Could you guys... Tell me how you work it out. You could do that that way. But you have to write it using terms like parentheses and addition and subtraction. That goes back to learning, knowing the language. 
I really like this. It was like opening Pandora's box with me. And I'm really interested in it now. Uh, main obstacles. Why should we have to read this? Rachel said this earlier. Would Rachel get? Why do we have to read this? Why do we have to know this? Um, word problems. Comprehending word problems is a problem. Creating them and solving them. And then the mathematical vocabulary. There are two main types of vocabulary in math. It's words with two meanings, like acute. Acute. What is acute in math? An acute angle. Smaller than I agree. Acute in other areas of life. Yeah, like they're in teenagers. They're saying, oh, he's a cute boy. Yeah. Well, that. <laughs> yeah. Acute, yes. Words with two meanings. And function. How do you function in society? But there's also finding a function in calculus. And then words found only in math, like denominator. I'll be working later. General strategies to use. These are the ones that I found most. Journal writing, personal vocabularies, personal glossaries, KWLs. I put the I wonder in there because I like that. But these are the main ones that I found. They're all they're all good in their own ways. Um, the personal vocabularies. I had a freshman algebra teacher that pounded vocabulary on us. I don't remember any of the vocabulary she ever taught me. Because all she did was give lists and we had a vocabulary test. That was it. And there was no correlation there between the math being taught and the vocabulary. It was, she had a good idea, but I don't think she implemented it very well. But I mean, she was still a good teacher. Um, so it, vocabularies are great and glossaries are great, but you have to have a little bit more there than just giving it to them. And like we talked about, Getting it out of the back of the book. Um, word problems. Mariah had 20 apples with which to bake pies. She will need five apples for each pie. How many pies can she bake? What do you guys think? Four. Four. Yeah. But we're all like very well versed in this simple of a word problem with our age. But for younger kids, it could be hard, even for middle schoolers. That could be a very hard problem for some. And it's our job as teachers. When you see that, you can make it into more of a more relatable word problem. Use their names. Break it down. Take it sentence by sentence. Uh, look closely at the mathematical terms. And then draw a picture, graph, Mariah has 20 apples. Draw 20 apples. She will need five apples for each pie. We'll circle five, and then circle five, circle five, circle five. How many apples are in each? How many groups of five apples are there? And then you can go ahead and rewrite it. Um, I found that in sixth grade, they work a lot on percent discounts. And mathematical terminology is 5% of $20. Well, what's 5% of $20 if they're going to take it off? Well, 5%, put that into a decimal, 0 0.05 of means times. So 0 0.05 times 20. And then you will just, you'll get what 5% of 20 is. And then you can, that, I should have <laughs> All right, and the writing word problems is um, this is a great strategy for writing them. Um, open ended questions, deeper thinking for the standardized test. Write a word problem represented by six divided by one half. Could you guys do that? <laughs> Well, a study I found asked 45, 45 sixth grade students, and I think maybe it was less than 10% knew what it was, like knew how to write it. Um, but one way you could break it down, how many groups of one half are in six holes? That's an example of rewording it. Could you guys solve it more easily with that sentence? Yeah, um, and this was the best 
Oh, sorry. This was the best example that a student gave. Alan had six apples and cut them in half. Now he wants to know how many apple halves he has. Tell Alan how many apple halves he has. Whew. That was alliteration there. All right, and this is how they graded it. It's either incorrect, minimal, partial, satisfactory, or extended, above and beyond. That last one was five. Uh, mathematical vocabulary. All triangles are considered similar. Is it true or false? Raise your hand for true. I don't know. I think it's Raise your hand for false. It is false. <laughs> it's okay. That's why I don't teach math. Mathematical vocabulary. Words with two meanings. Similar in math. Identical in shape and they are proportional. Um, words with two meanings. Challenge yourself. Compare and contrast. Um, similar and similar. And you can write regular English and math. Make a Venn diagram. How are they alike? How are they different? That similar means almost, but not actually like it. But they can be proportional. Right. Proportional. One well, might be bigger, but it has the same angle. When it's, yeah, congruent, where it lays right on top. Words found only in math denominator, isosceles, parabola. Is this a foreign language to you? <laughs> well, this is um, this is a dictionary I found. Of, I actually have this book at home, but the library has it also. I'll pass it around. Um, it's just the vocabulary dictionary of math terms. And this is what you can do. You can break like isosceles down into two parts and look at their historical roots. Isos means equal and skeletos means legs. And in math, the two sides with the slashes on them, those are called legs. So equal legs. See, this makes it fun. <laughs> and the words that are being used, they're mul factor multiple. I, I find that kids have a problem with that radius and diameter. But does it, well, slow it down, keep your counting words at different times. <laughs> this is something I have used in a classroom. It's kind of like a word sort. Sum plus all the other perimeter. Those are all words used for addition. And then difference. Those are all words used for subtraction, multiplication, division. And then there's all that and that and there's that. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. I got that class is way longer than I thought it was. No, I thought it was good. I thought it was really good. Everybody else. I love that thing, but I saw that. That's how my head feels about it. Oh. Okay. Um, Ina, you're going to do yeah, the reading. Yeah. Okay. You're checking. You can do it. another, anything right now for Ina, or just out through here? I use some of this stuff I like right now for my own kids because I don't know if they'll get into school, but at least I can introduce you to them. I'll get a
to the arm again. Oh, read to me. Not me. Not me. Not me. They would all run and hide. Where are you all going? Let's go. Hide. Run. And they would not come out. Come out here. Come out here and read to me. The lion didn't know what to do. They are your books. You read them. The lion couldn't read the book. The lion didn't know how to read. I can't read. What? You can't? Can you guess what the rabbit said? And the monkey? And the elephant? Can you guess what they said? We will teach you how to read. Thank you, thank you. And that is what they did. Now, the lion can read to them. Read to me. More, more. Read it again. Oh, that's a perfect book. <laughs> so, what is the most important activity for reading, uh, for building understandings and skill uh, essential uh, for reading? What is the most important? Read aloud, yes. Read aloud to children. And I have a little um, uh, saying here. Reading aloud with children is not known to be the single most important activity for building the knowledge and skills they will eventually require for learning to read. Why should we read aloud? So, reading aloud presents books as sources of pleasant, valuable, and exciting experiences. It gives children background knowledge, as already was told today, which helps them make sense of what they see, hear, and read. It lets parents and teachers be role models for reading. It can introduce books and types of literature, poetry, short stories, biographies. It also introduces the language of books, which differs from language heard in daily conversations on television and in movies. Book language is more descriptive and uses more formal grammatical structures. It lets children use their imaginations to explore people, places, times, and events beyond their experiences. It gives children and adults something to talk about. It supports the development of thinking skills as children and adults discuss books, articles, and other texts we read together, and it's fun. Reading aloud in children's emerging literacy and language skills. How are they connected? During shared book reading, children learn to recognize letters. They understand that print represents the spoken word. They learn how to hold a book, turn the page, and start at the beginning. They learn print concepts. And they are exposed to the written language register, story structures, and literacy conventions such as syntax and grammar. Um, how is phonological awareness and alphabet knowledge connected to reading aloud? What's the in influence there? When children are being read aloud to, they acquire sensitivity to different sounds in a specific order, although stages may overlap. They learn about phonemes or sounds more or less informally by learning to name letters and by recognizing which phoneme is critical in the name. And they acquire awareness of initial phonemes or shared phonemes across words. And statistics shows there are important differences in letter knowledge between children from middle and lower class families. Four-year-old children from middle class families knew average of 54% of the letter names, and five-year-old children knew 85% of the letters. However, four- and five-year-old children from low-income families who enter programs such as Head Start know on average only four letters and learn an additional five while enrolled in the program, program and it's because of the lack of reading aloud to them. Reading out uh, and language development. During shared book reading, children learn the meaning of new words, children's vocabulary grows, Children are engaged in more verbal interaction than in a toy play or other adult-child interaction. And again, statistics. 
Large social class differences have been reported in children's exposure to oral language in their vocabulary. Hardin wisely reported that at age three, children in professional families heard an, aver an average of 2,153 words per hour, while children in working class families heard 1,251 words per hour, and children in welfare families heard only 616 words per hour. This led to enormous differences in children's vocabularies. At age three, children in professional families had an observed cumulative vocabulary of 1,100 words, while children in working class had an observed vocabulary of 750, and those in welfare, uh, welfare families of just about 500 words. So we need to talk for it. Mm -hmm. uh, reading aloud as a shared experience. When sharing a book, children not only acquire knowledge about narratives, but also learn their own personal narrative. Children learn about peer relationships, coping strategies, building self-esteem, and general, general world knowledge. It can play an important role in wake and sleep patterns by making book reading part of bedtime routine. There, uh, there is different style of uh, book reading, shared book reading. Uh, and what's important about it is that the style of reading, more than frequency, impact children's early language and literacy development. There are two parental styles. First one is the describer style, and it focuses on describing the pictures during the reading. And then the second one is the performance-oriented style, which focuses more on discussing the meaning of the story after completion. And children with initial lower levels, or younger children, uh, they profited more from the describer style, but while children with higher initial vocabulary levels profited m most from uh, the performance-oriented style. Again, statistics. Um, Whitehurst et al. developed an intervention program called Dialogic Reading to promote children's language development. Adults are taught specific techniques that can be used during shared book reading. These techniques focus on asking questions, providing feedback, and letting the child become the narrator of the story. Children whose parents received training in dialogic reading had significantly better expressive language skills, used longer and more utterances, and had lower frequency of single words than children whose parents did not use dialogic reading. These differences between the groups remained even nine months after the training. So if we read aloud, we don't need to, we, we shouldn't just, just read aloud. We need to prepare for it and make it right. Uh, there is a Reach Out and Read program, which I've never heard about. Uh, it was founded at Boston City Hospital in 1989, which promotes early childhood development by promoting reading aloud. And uh, in response to the small percentage of low-income parents, Reading to their children, ROR, was created to involve ch child health clini clinicians by having them give new books to children and advise to parents about the importance of reading aloud as part of early child care, which I thought was a neat idea. And we can do it as teachers. And um, the question just to ask yourself, what can we as teachers do to promote reading aloud? And that's how I feel sometimes. <laughs> Especially right now, taking this class. <laughs> what is a successful read aloud? It involves careful selection of high quality texts, open ended questions asked by adults and children, discussions about the book, building from what children already know, and predictions by children of what they think might happen or come next to the book, and talks that ties the book to life beyond the classroom or the here and now, which is the con contextualized language. Planning for the read aloud. When choosing books, we have to look for books with powerful illustrations that will capture children's attention, uh, choose books that reflect the diversity, values, and interests, select a variety of types of books, including those with humor, those that convey information, books that help children grapple with pressing issues in their lives. Use books periodically that help develop specific literacy skills. Select books with high quality writing. Select books that offer opportunities for learning. 
in, important to consider the audience when you're picking the book. Uh, where you sit and how uh, are critical con considerations. Minimize distractions so a child can focus during the read aloud. Plan ways to alter your tone of voice. Um, uh, read the book ahead of time to avoid surprises related to content or unfamiliar words. Think where you can ask questions or teach new content or skills as part of the shared book reading. Plan for places in the text where you can ask children to make predictions or relate the book to what is happening. And think of different ways to engage children in the text, whether it is encouraging them to find a letter they know, read along with you, clap or snap fingers when they hear a special word of the, uh, of the day. Types of questions. There are several types of questions, and I'll just go uh, more quickly over them. Factual questions, the ones that ask for details about the text. Inferential questions, encourage children to read between the lines of the text. Opinion questions, invite children to tell you what they think. Text-to-self questions, bridge the text to child's own experience. Text-to-text, -text, bridge the text to another text that the child has read. Prediction questions, ask children to tell you what might happen next. Authorship questions, ask children to think like the author. Vocabulary questions, ask children what they know about a word. And when do we read aloud? From infancy through the high school years. At a predictable schedule time that, that fits with daily routines at home and at school. Read spontaneously, asking older student siblings to read to younger ones. Ask volunteers, visitors to read aloud to students. Read aloud at the doctor's office, on the bus, while waiting in line, or on a field trip. Other ideas? Up to you. Think about that. Okay. Just an example. A house, I found this one, a house without books is like a room without windows. No man has a right to bring up children without surrounding them with books. Children learn to read being in the presence of books. And I took his and changed it a little bit to fit the teachers. Um, here. A classroom without books is like a room without doors. No teacher has a right to educate children without surrounding them with books. Children learn, children learn to read being in the presence of books. Turn it up.